trying to be moderator here, but he's doing a presentation somewhere else, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, my um, research was not exclusive to witchcraft, although witchcraft was a large component of it. I was looking at uh, conversion in the context of illness and healthcare delivery at a mission hospital in uh, Togo, West Africa. And the components that I was looking at were uh, Western biomedicine, <coughs> a conversion, and uh, witchcraft, and how the three of these interfaced as patients were coming to the hospital. And so I interviewed, uh, the, the threshold was 30 one-hour interviews. I was able to interview 36, and these were all people that had accepted or come to faith or converted to Christ uh, while they were receiving treatment at this hospital. The hospital had been in existence, uh, has been in existence for 27 years, so I was able to interview somebody who converted to Christianity uh, the year the hospital opened in 1987 and somebody else who had converted the day before in the clinic. So I had a uh, wide spread there. One of the things that I was particularly inter interested in, the uh, reason I wanted to do this, was the hospital that I, uh, my wife and I served in for 10 years. I was the hospital director and uh, uh, a nurse and uh, ran the operating room and other things, was in the uh, town of Chico, which is uh, a small village uh, right on the Ghana border, about a half hour north of Palime, if uh, you're familiar with Chico at all. And our mission is in the process of opening a new hospital in the north of Togo, Mongo. This is a five and a half million dollar project, and uh, this is going to open in January of uh, 2015. And so the concept for this was based upon what has happened over the past two, three decades in the Southern Hospital. But there hasn't been any real research as to really the outcomes or what is uh, happening culturally, the dynamics involved in that with the patients that are there. So I wanted to spend time doing that, particularly since uh, I'd served in that hospital and had a lot of questions. Here was uh, one of the promotional uh, flyers that was used to raise this money to build the hospital up north. And if you'll notice right here, it says 2,400 people come to Christ each year at the hospital. These new believers have returned to their villages to cultivate church plants throughout Togo and so forth. That 2,400 figure has actually been reported since the hospital opened in, 20, uh, in 1987. So if you do the math, that's over 70,000 people. That's like a perpetual uh, revival. And so I was wondering, I was wondering this when I was there myself and we were looking at these, uh, at these numbers when I was the director of the hospital and wondering where are all these people and what is really happening? At the time, uh, I didn't have the skills to uh, research that. And the other thing, if you're working on a medical staff and you take time to do research, you become unpopular very fast with your colleagues. Uh, okay, here is a, just looking at the past 12 years, Here's the conversions that took place in the hospital, and these are the conversions that took place in the clinic. You can see there's many more in the clinic because uh, there's obviously more people coming through there. And for just that 12-year uh, period, uh, there's a combined total of 31,000. The average number is actually a little bit higher. Uh, it's 2,600 than what's being reported, at least in that 12 years. Okay, <clears throat> I want to leave this. I don't want to talk about that. I'm going to go to my, my paper here. I have another paper there that has the findings in it. I'm not going to talk about that. It's there. If there's any time at the end, we'll do that. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to read all of this. The first part uh, talks about uh, the medical uh, aspect of biomedicine, why, how, how biomedicine came to the forefront in the modern mission movement. But let me start at the bottom of page two where it says, uh, witchcraft, the last sentence there, witchcraft occupies a primary role in understanding illness and the interpretation of daily events in the lives of the Togolese. No one can understand life in Africa without understanding witchcraft and the related aspects of spiritual insecurity. This insecurity rose to the surface through the interview process and provided one of the primary contributions to understanding the relationship between Western biomedicine and Christian conversion. The conversion discourses demonstrate that witches continue to be a concern in the lives of the converts and the fear of witchcraft remains a troublesome reality. Interpersonal causal ontology is representative of explanations given for evil and suffering in West Africa. This ontology is associated with the idea that one can be made sick by the envy or ill will of colleagues, neighbors, and associates. Therapy focuses upon talismans and other protective devices, strategies, for avoidance or aggressive counterattack, and quite crucially on the repair of interpersonal relationships. The interpersonal causal agent is a witch. 
the term which applies to either a male or female being who is said to be the cause of another's misfortune, sickness, and the, or death by means of psychic or occult power. Interpersonal causation was the primary reason respondents gave for their illnesses. 31 of 36 interviewees re referenced malevolent others as a causative agent. They were reluctant at times to attribute cause to others, but as the interviews progressed, they would suggest that it was a possibility or at least someone had told them that someone else was responsible for their illness or calamity. The subjects that I interviewed did not indicate that they attempted to discover who was responsible for their illness, but some implied that they were suspicious of others due to their behaviors or events that occurred in conjunction with their presence. It is interesting that all of those who believed their illness had interpersonal causal base sought biomedical treatment. Park observed that sufferers are more likely to seek a biomedical therapy for a problem than to offer a biomedical explanation of it. Interpersonal therapies are less likely to be sought than interpersonal explanations of suffering are to be offered. That is, in fact, what we see in the respondent discourses on the illness, uh, at, on illness at, the, at the Baptist Hospital. Much Mohaptarta and Park suggest that the reason for this deferment to biomedical therapy may be the sense of control that a patient gains through corporal treatment and the success of biomedical interventions. Uh, I just want to mention when I was out there uh, doing my field research, there were uh, 40 short-term missionaries that came through in, in that, that period. Uh, a department from Wake Forest University of Plastic Surgeons came out and performed a variety of, uh, of uh, plastic surgeries, which are very dramatic when you look at the results from that. Uh, characteristic, characteristic of interpersonal causal ontology is the attribution of culpability to the other. The first thought offered by respondents when seeking an etiology for illness or cause for calamity is often a malicious spiritual force invoked by the ill will of another. A 42-year-old man was drunk and drove his motorcycle off the road breaking his clavicle. He reported that his brothers told him that people in the village envied him because of his motorcycle and his job as an electrician. They had a curse placed on him which resulted in his accident. Another case involves a 22-year-old man who had an accident with his motorcycle. He was admitted to the hospital unconscious with a broken femur. He stated that he drove around a corner and saw what appeared to be cows or sheep in the road, but he could not see, see clearly. He applied his brakes and swerved off the road, hitting and killing a man walking on the side of the road. I asked him if witchcraft had a role in his accident, and he responded by saying the devil, Abosam, had done this to him. He was convinced that the demons created an apparition of cows or sheep in the road, causing him to lose control of his motorcycle. He mentioned that he was driving with two passengers, one in the front and one behind him. This is illegal in Togo. However, he did not view his moving violation as the primary cause of the accident. These cases are examples among the interviews of moral causation, personal culpability, that were interpreted with an interpersonal cause. Anonymous others or demonic forces were accused even when personal responsibility seemed to be the clear cause. These men are not ignorant or unaware that they were driving impaired or illegally. I asked the man who had been driving, uh, drinking prior to his accident why he thought this happened to him. He responded, according to my father, it was because we were drunk. He received two different causations from separate family members, one interpersonal and the other moral. This man was aware that his drunkenness was a causal factor in his accident. However, respondents often sought deeper meanings for illness, calamity, and misfortune in their lives. For African people, these are not purely physical experiences. They are mystical experiences of a deeply religious nature. Biological causation or natural causes are not denied, but they may not provide a completely satisfactory explanation. The spiritual and physical uh, comprise an ontological and existential matrix that is separated that it isn't separated in the worldview of Africa. The consideration of a spiritual cause for illness and misfortune is always present. This doesn't negate the acceptance of biological pathologic ideologies, but recognizes the possibility of an associate spiritual cause. There's a quote there by uh, Mbiti where he talks about a woman being, her child being bit by a mosquito and the child dies. And she completely understands uh, the uh, the issue related to malaria, but she asked the question, why did the mosquito bite my child and not somebody else's? And the biomedical practitioner stands there stunned. 
uh, there's no explanation for that. That's somewhat of uh, Paul Hebert's uh, flaw of the excluded middle. Uh, there is a great deal of confusion, inconsistency, and contradiction that surrounds the subject of witchcraft, bottom paragraph. A 26-year-old male denounced the practice of fetish priests for implicating others for someone's illness. His quote is, they do not have obvious proof to say that this is it. They are deceivers, end of quote. Later in the interview, he confirmed that he believed in the existence of witchcraft. I asked him how he knew that this was true. He told me the story of his sister-in-law who entered his room. That night, the child, his, his small child, lay crying during the night. The next day, the sister-in-law came back and entered the room. The child began crying after she left. He accused the woman of being a charlatan. The evidence was the response of the child to which he said, it is proof. This man seemed to be unaware that he was now serving in the capacity as the fetish priest whom he had just denounced. Interpersonal uh, causation in the Christian community. I want to drop down to the uh, uh, next to last paragraph on that page where it says, the theory anthropy is a belief that people can turn into animals to attract their, attack their victims. This was a predominant belief that surfaced in respondent narratives. One woman expressed her fear of witches by saying, I fear them so that I won't fall into their mouth so that they will not catch me. People said that they catch people's spirits and the person will die or something bad will happen to them. This is a reference to soul eating. The pastors do not preach on the topic of witchcraft. There is an uncertainty about how to present the topic theologically and how it would affect their congregations. More importantly, there's a fear that it would split the churches. The minority population in the plateau region around the hospital and in the churches is Kabye. The Ave, which are the majority ethnic group, believe that the Kabye are adept at witchcraft and that numerous church members are active in witchcraft matters. Pastor de pastors deal with witchcraft issues on a case-by-case -case basis through private counseling. Their counsel serves to reinforce witchcraft beliefs among their counselees. It's an in inadvertently they're doing this. Several examples are seen in the following interviews I had it with uh, hospital patients. A 35-year-old man reported that after he returned from working on his farm, he developed an erythema on his leg, a raised red itching area. He went to visit his pastor when the area began to swell. The pastor counseled him to wear boots when he goes to the field to prevent evil ones from harming him with black powder. The farmer followed the pastor's counsel and this instant incident did not recur. Another respondent reported in an interview that he and his young son went to the village well one morning. A hawk flew down and struck the boy with its wings and talons while they were drawing water. That evening, the child developed a fever. The father reported this incident to his pastor and was told that a charlatan sent the hawk to capture his son. The pastor prayed and shared scripture with the family until the fever passed. I interviewed the woman of the boy who was attacked by the hawk. She shared, that a narrative, she shared the same narrative in response to a question about persecution for her faith. Later in the interview, I asked her if she believed that witches exist and cause harm and death to others. She responded by saying, the reason I know they exist is because a simple bird will not come flying only to hit a person. I know that an evil spirit was sent to that place. Other causal ontologies were not considered as possible explanations of these events. Assumptions were made in each of the three interviews referenced above without any corroborating evidence. The subjects in each case defaulted to an interpersonal causal explanation of the circumstances and resulting illnesses. Magisa states that of the pastoral problems facing the missionary founded or mainstream churches in Africa, witchcraft and polygamy are perhaps the most prevalent and intractable challenges of the church today. Of the two, witchcraft is obviously the most widespread. This topic does not seem to be receiving the attention needed within the Togolese churches. 14 different affiliated Baptist churches from the Plateau region were represented among the interviewees. These churches are members in the Association of uh, Bible Baptist Churches of Togo. There are 38 churches in the, there are 83 churches in this association. The annual meeting of a SEPTA was held in the Plateau region in May 2012 during my interviews. The main topics on the agenda, these were all Africans, there were no missionaries involved in this. The main topics of the agenda were music and dancing in the churches. The failure of churches to address the subject of witch witchcraft results in a lack of discernment among members when they are faced with causative options for illness and calamity. There was no substantive post-conversion change in witchcraft beliefs among the Christian converts I interviewed. A prominent term used by respondents in their discourses was freedom. A 24-year-old female made the following response. 
When I was in the world, evil spirits troubled me, but when I accepted Christ, I have not been hearing the name of any of them. I asked respondents if they feared witchcraft since they had converted to Christ. From the 36 interviews, only four stated they fear witches. 20 said they have no fear, seven gave no answer, and five offered conflicting responses by affirming and disavowing. Respondents offered statements that reflected 1 John 4, 4, such as, he who is in the world is greater than he is in you. Statements were made such as, we Christians do not have anything in common with evil spirits, or when I am in Christ, I no longer have fear of evil spirits. Again, Satan can't go past Christ to reach me. And finally, my faith in Jesus changed this fear because I am with God and the sorcerers can do nothing to me. The teaching in the churches regarding evil spirits is that a believer can't be possessed or subjected to incantations and bewitchment by another. The interviewees are aware of this teaching, but perhaps there are two separate realities which, with which they struggle. This may account for the five respondents who made contradictory statements about their fear of witchcraft. There is another item that may contribute to the doubt among the respondents who said they have no fear of witchcraft. Seven of the 20 who said they had no fear of witches also said that their illnesses were, illness was the result of witchcraft. An additional four said they weren't sure, but it was a possibility that someone caused their illness through spiritual means. It would seem that if one did not fear witchcraft, he or she would not attribute an accident or illness to malevolent others. This is a cause to fear. Witchcraft accusations in the Christian community. Witchcraft is both a subject of gossip and a product of gossip. Gossip is the medium with which it, within which it lives. Gossip is the means by which witchcraft accusations take seed and grow. I met a 31-year-old Kabye woman the minority group, <clears throat> in 1992 when she came to the hospital with a tropical ulcer on her ankle. She received a skin graft and lived in the hospital hostel while she received post-operative outpatient care. She converted from Islam to Christ during the course of her care and was baptized and joined the Chico Church in 1993. She was discipled during this time by missionaries and Chico Church leaders. I left Togo in 1994 and returned in 2011 and 2012 to conduct field research. I encountered this woman upon my return. She is now an employee of the hospital, a faithful member at the Chico Church, and actively involved in evangelism on the female ward of the hospital. She met the criteria of my research project, and I interviewed her on two occasions between March and June 2012. There were several characteristics about this 51-year-old woman that were remarkable. She offered one of the clearest narratives of her conversion experience among the 36th I interviewed. A uh, second noteworthy fact is she still has the same tropical ulcer on her ankle after receiving five skin grafts over a 20-year period. She fits the profile of someone who might be the target of witch accusations. She is female, an ethnic minority, lives alone, and has an incurable wound. Those who are accused of witchcraft are often the socially marginalized, marginalized such as lepers or those with infectious diseases, elderly widows, and young orphans. This respondent reported to me that she had been evicted from three different rental properties when the landlords discovered she had an open wound. My linguist was a five-year-old girl, and I might add she was also the, past, the uh, daughter of the pastor of one of the churches. Uh, she was a five-year-old girl, a second-generation Christian, when this woman came to the hospital for treatment in 1992. She told me that she heard witchcraft rumors about her as a child. She also mentioned that recently... Uh, she had heard a story that this woman walked on her head at night and other activities that implicated her as a witch. This story was reported by a young girl who had been the housekeeper of the accused. I asked my linguist if she believed these stories and she was reluctant to respond. I restated my question and she said they could be true. I asked this woman if Christians, that is the accused, if Christians accused her of being a sorcerer because of her wound. She responded, if someone insults you, he will not insult you in front of you like this. When you leave, they will talk. People talk a lot. Whisper that me, I am a sorcerer, but I do not hear it. They can't say it in front of me. Yes, the people in Africa think that if you have a wound that does not heal, you are a sorcerer. Non-hospital illnesses. Health-seeking behaviors are influenced by the perceived efficacy of biomedicine among healthcare options. This relates particularly to the conceptual etiology of an illness. Biomedicine may not be deemed as an effective intervention for illnesses arising from interpersonal causation. Respondents referred to this as non-hospital illnesses. Illness that emanates from witchcraft can only be cured spiritually. A 29-year-old woman received an oophorectomy, that is a removal of her ovary, for an ectopic pregnancy. 
She reported that a person cannot be healed at a hospital if they become ill by stepping on an object or substance that has been cursed. They cannot treat it at the hospital, quote. Only witch doctors can treat it. Another example of the inability of Western biomedicine to provide a cure is that of a 35-year-old female. She fell into a pit at night, fracturing her spine, which resulted in paralysis below the waist. She responded to a question about what Jesus did for her by saying, I want him to heal me. She was discharged from the hospital two months after my interview as a paraplegic. She provided an explanation for the lack of a cure at the time of her discharge. Quote, some people say that some illnesses are not to be taken to the hospital. She told me that it was the, demon, the work of demons that led her into the pit, causing her paralysis. The failure of biomedical interventions to provide a cure was confirmation to her that the cause of her accident was spiritually induced. There's a great need to bring this discussion about witchcraft out of the shadows. However, there's a great danger in doing this because of the uncertainty that surrounds the subject and the fear that it creates. Public discussion of the subject could devolve into public accusations. There is no solid informed basis to support dialogue apart from gossip opinion and the personal experience of Africans or lack of experience on the part of Western missionaries. Belief in witchcraft is universal among the interviewees and pastors to whom I spoke. Witchcraft beliefs are constructed and propagated through gossip and innuendo and perpetuated by fear. These beliefs appear to have been reified in the consciousness of those whom I interviewed. Witchcraft is subjective and secretive. The entities involved in the propagation and implementation of witchcraft are spiritual and therefore can't be verified by an empirical process. So in talking to them, when uh, I would try to point out a logical uh, demise of their, their argument, it didn't matter because there's two realities that are, that are paralleling each other and they don't intersect. <clears throat> uh, this creates a dilemma. People do not know what they should believe about witchcraft, so there's a tendency to believe everything they hear. Uh, conversely, uh, most Western missionaries don't, believe, don't know what to believe, so they don't believe anything. The respondents were satisfied that anecdotal evidence was sufficient to confirm the presence of witchcraft as cause, even when it contradicted scripture or when other explanation offered uh, viable alternatives. And I want you to go to uh, page 13 and the second paragraph down where it says patience. Patience may not be told, this is, talk, this is referring to uh, the gospel that's uh, communicated to them when they're at the hospital receiving care or prior to receiving care. Patients may not be told explicitly that they will be healed if they convert to Christ, but salvation and healing are linked in evangelistic messages so that this becomes an understanding and an expectation of patients. Magic may not be an integral part of the gospel as it is presented at the hospital, but there are attendant aspects of magic which accompany the proclamation of the gospel. The following statement was made in the gospel presentation to clinic patients. We don't trust medicines, we don't trust any doctor, but God will make a miracle in your life if you say this prayer this morning. It is true that the Lord is a God of miracles and he can heal. However, this statement discounts natural processes and places healing in the singular realm of spiritual warfare, warfare with healing contingent upon conversion. The sinner's prayer in this context can easily be misconstrued as a magical incantation with commonalities closely associated with traditional African religion. The devil gets too much credit for unexplainable events. Demons exert a greater influence than God on people's interests in their daily lives. This does not discount the reality of evil spirits or their activity, but there is a strong tendency to identify an evil spirit behind every tree, around every corner, and under every rock. Evil spirits and witchcraft become the default explanation for unexplainable events and untoward circumstances. There is significant fear in the Christian community which claims to have victory over the devil and his demons. Witchcraft remains an intransigent belief in the post-conversion experience of those I interviewed and is representative of the institutionalization of witchcraft within the broader Christian community. It appeared that respondents were living in two worlds expressing the ideologies of traditional religion and biblical Christianity at the same time. This syncretism was evident in respondents' beliefs in the existence and power of ancestral spirits, witches, attendant witchcraft discourses, and the amalgamation of conversion and healing. At the same time, those I interviewed have rejected the ceremonial activities of animism and clearly articulated a personal conversion with Christian life experience and in many cases have suffered for their faith. 
Christian identity in all times and cultures is discovered biblically and contextually. This remains an unfinished task in the Togolese Christian community. <laughs> Tink. There's six minutes left. Uh, I listened to everybody else talk, doing these things, and I said, man, they're reading way too fast. And I just did the same. 